There is so much aerodynamically wrong with this Mercedes, but still, it achieved a very good drag coefficient, just 0.29, back in the 2000s. That value is better than a lot of sedans today. And this E-Class did it with a design that doesn't follow conventional aerodynamic wisdom. That shows just how skilled the Mercedes aerodynamicists were. For example, the rear window is very steep. This is literally one of the first things you learn about car aerodynamics. The steeper the rear window is, the more likely the flow is to separate over it. That then increases the wake size and the drag sky rockets. Here, the E-Class is flirting with the line. It is very steep, but the flow still stays attached to it and we don't get a wake or the huge drag that comes with it. How did Mercedes achieve that though? Well, they used a couple tricks. The first is that if you look at where the roof meets the rear window, there isn't much of an edge. Instead, it's more of a curved interface between the two. What that does is give the air a longer distance to change from the roof's angle to the rear window's angle. That allowed the E-Class to have such a sloped rear window still, but keep the flow attached. The other trick Mercedes did was quite brilliant actually. So it's a little complicated, but if we look at these streamlines, we can see how the streamlines around the upper sides of the E-Class get directed around the rear edge, and even almost over the roof, and then down the rear window. That feeds the rear window with more flow and takes up any area that might have had bad flow down it. To be perfectly honest, I'm not sure if this was done on purpose because getting the flow to travel like this is very difficult to get right. For example, looking at the side mirrors, we see how it splits the flow and I think by chance it directs it around the lower part of the C-pillar and over the trunk. If it were on purpose, then this mechanism comes with quite a lot of drag. We can see in this drag orbit that the C-pillars produce a lot of drag and that makes this car's drag coefficient even more impressive because it is low despite stray drag production like this. If we rounded these edges more, this drag would become less. And over the rear window, we did get some low pressure. But if we've got the pressure plot, we can see that there is good high pressure over the trunk too. That pushes the car into the ground more so that it can lay more of its power into it. And that is evident if we look at the lift produced. Okay, so this car definitely wasn't designed to be a performance car, but still, at 130 kph, it produces 27 kilos of lift. That's not great, but the fact that this number is so low at such a high speed is fairly impressive for this car still. I mean, there aren't any fancy devices like a rear wing or a front splitter to help increase downforce, but still this lift production is manageable. How does it achieve a respectable amount of lift and not an embarrassing amount of lift? Well, a lot of that has to do with the trunk. It's quite flat. For drag, that is quite bad, but we'll get to that. First, the lift. Because this is so flat, when the flow over the window comes down, it slams into the trunk. If the trunk were more in line with the rear window, the flow wouldn't hit the trunk as much. That's important because the more the flow hits the rear, the more its energy gets converted into static pressure. That is why we get this red region here. That's the pressure pushing down and creating downforce. If it weren't for this trunk being so flat, we wouldn't be getting as much downforce. But because it is so flat, the flow dumps quite a bit of its energy into the trunk and that means more drag as we can see in this drag orbit. So this trunk is a blessing and a curse. Now one of your amigos, Trevor, commissioned us to simulate this car for him. If you'd like us to simulate your very own car, let us know here. Another region that looks high drag is the interface between the hood and the windshield. But here, it is also high drag. The hood is sloped down a little, and that helps reduce how much the flow comes along and crashes into the windshield, much like we saw at the rear with the trunk, but it's not enough here. The flow still dumps a lot of its energy into the windshield, as we can see by how slow the flow becomes. We can see how blue it is here. Even if we move over half a meter to the left, we still get quite a bit of flow deceleration. It's not as bad, the flow stays pretty green instead of the blue we saw in the center plane, but it still does decelerate quite a lot. Looking at the pressure in the center plane, we get quite a lot of high pressure, and the high pressure extends a lot up the windshield too. That tells us that there is a lot of pressure pushing the car back and creating drag. So this region is one of the few regions around the car 
that genuinely has bad aerodynamics for drag. But that high pressure also helps push the car into the road even more, and that reduces the overall lift produced. So there's a silver lining here, and that's what life's about. If we move back to the streamlines, we saw that they wrap around the front and flow over the sides well. But anytime you have a lot of sideways movement over the windshield, it increases the drag. We can see in the drag orbit where these regions of drag in the corners form. That has a lot to do with the air clip in the front of the A-pillars and kind of getting hindered. One way to reduce this drag would be to round the A-pillars edges more. You can particularly do that more low down where the flow gets caught up in these regions too. But that's about it for the really bad regions of drag for this car. There are many good regions around this car and some of them are sneakily good. For example, the front of the car might seem bad because it's quite flat and that comes with a lot of flow hitting it, decelerating and dumping much of its kinetic energy into it. But there's only one really bad region, just here where the blue flow is. Not far up, the flow maintains some decent speed. That's because the top of the front is a little rounded. That minor detail helps the flow travel from the front to around the hood and reduce how much the flow has to decelerate there. So that small region does a lot to reduce the drag here. One region I really like is the front underbody lip. Mercedes just did this region right. It doesn't look like much, but there's actually a lot going on. First of all, the underbody is sloped up a little. For aerodynamics, this is great because it squeezes the flow slowly. That's good because it's not shocking the flow. A lot of cars take the opposite approach where the underbody is kind of one height at the front and the air has to somehow turn around the front edge and flow underneath. By having this gradual contraction, the air can more easily flow around the front edge because it's now gentler, and that means it can stay attached to the underbody easier. And we do get that here, we don't get a wake or drag locally. Nor is there now bad flow going underneath the underbody and feeding the other critical parts of the car, like the diffuser, with bad flow either. Because the flow stays attached around this lip, the underbody has much better flow to work with, so it can perform better now. But the E-Class has one more trick here to help the flow stay attached. The front lip is slightly chamfered. As we've seen in many other videos, chamfers almost always work well here. They give the flow a little more distance to turn around, much like over the rear of the roof where we saw that very sharp turn distributed over a larger area. That then allowed the air to follow it much more easily. Here at the front, we get the exact same thing. The front underneath is done so well. As a reward, we not only get lower drag here because we don't get a wake, but we also get stable low pressure, which helps suck the car down to the road more. The more stable the downforce is, and really any force on the car is, the easier it is to control. That leads us to the diffuser. By modern standards, it's pretty good. There are a few things exposed that aren't great, but let's remember that this was designed 20 years ago. Back then, this diffuser was excellent. We can see here that it is large and in charge. It starts from the rear wheels and actually slopes up quite a lot. That helps guide the flow up more, and we end up getting this quite small wake. Now I should mention that this wake is also small because the rear window slopes down so much and shrinks the rear face a lot. Combining this with the good work the diffuser is doing, the wake size drops a lot, and with that, the drag drops a lot too. The only thing that could really be improved is covering the exposed stuff under the diffuser. These things sticking out are just bad for the flow because they churn up the flow a little instead of providing a clean surface for it to travel over. But overall, this diffuser is very good, me likey. And the pressure plot shows that we get good low pressure under here too, which helps up the car down and reduce the overall lift on the car. This is just the center plane though. If we jump over half a meter to the left, we see that the diffuser is still performing pretty well. Not as well, but there's still some good stuff happening here. First of all, we have the weight from the rear wheels, and even from the front wheels, flowing into it. That reduces how steady the flow is over it, and the low pressure produced. But still, the diffuser is doing a pretty okay job guiding it to the wake and reducing its size, sometimes. A way to increase the diffuser's effectiveness would be to use strakes to isolate the wake from the rear wheels, and then prevent it from moving inboard more. For example, in this plane, which is 20 centimeters off the ground, we can see how the weight from the rear wheels encroach inwards a little. It's really not that bad, it's controlled pretty well, but strakes would help push these weights out more 
and increase the good flow over the diffuser. Because the diffuser is so large, small differences here make large differences to the lift and drag overall. In this plane, we see some other very impressive regions. The first is around the front edges. The flow stays attached very well and no wakes are formed. The front wheels are also pretty good. There is a large wake, but it forms from around halfway, not from the front of the tire. And actually, much of this large wake is coming from the very open rims too. The air can flow through them and create a lot of drag here. So a way to reduce the drag coefficient easily would be to change these AMG rims to more covered rims. The rear wheel wakes, while large, are very good still. They're much smaller than a lot of cars. So the E-Class is doing very well here. But that's nothing compared to 20 centimeters higher. We're now at 40 centimeters off the ground, and the flow is a dream. There are only two bad regions, and both of these regions are to be expected. We'll also go through some potential ways to fix them. But first, the front wheel region is pretty bad. There is a little weight coming from them. That is because the air inside the wheelhouse is shooting out the rims, and one way to reduce this phenomenon would be to put vents behind the wheelhouses to help the flow inside the wheelhouses come out through there. Another way is to cover the rims more, and then a third way is to use even larger wheels and tires to take up more of the wheelhouse volume so not as much air can come out through this way. So this region, which doesn't produce that much drag now, could be improved a little bit. The only other bad region here is the rear wake. It isn't as small as it could be because the flow from the rear wheel house comes out and separates around this edge here. That creates a wake prematurely and that travels downstream and in effect makes the rear wake larger overall. We then get more drag because of it. This problem comes about because the wheelhouse flow has to exit somewhere and unfortunately it's here. Putting vents behind the rear wheel houses and funneling some of the flow out to the wake would help that. That would reduce the amount of flow coming out and separating around this corner. The wake would then be smaller and the drag would drop. Now at 60 centimeters off the ground, we get similar problems. In effect, the flow inside the wheelhouses aren't being managed that well. So we get some wakes and more drag. These simulations were done with open foam and power view. If you'd like to learn them, then check out our courses here. If we move up to 80 centimeters off the ground, now the flow is incredibly good. It stays attached over the entire side and only separates right at the rear edge as it should. The wake then becomes tiny and the drag drops. This right here is one of the main reasons why this Merc has such a low drag coefficient from 20 years ago. The flow here is almost perfect. Then at one minute off the ground, something I'm very impressed with is how the flow stays attached down the sides after the mirrors. The mirrors produce wakes and it's all too easy for the flow down the sides to then become jumbled up with that wake and separate itself. But because some flow shoots through between the mirrors and the sides, and more flow comes from below and above, as the streamlines meander around, this region is fueled with good flow still. It can then remain attached to the rear and only separate at the rear edges. That reduces the wake size and hence the drag. And things only get better when moving up to 1.2 meters off the ground. There was almost no wake anywhere. The only bad region might be behind the C pillars. There's a little recirculation, which is partly because they are so sharp back here, and partly because the streamlines whip around the sides so much, instead of the flow here completely coming from down the rear window. So this Mercedes is really a case where the higher up you go on it, the better it becomes. Another car like that is the Volkswagen Golf here. Check it out. Peace and amigos.